Good morning. So two technological things worked at the same time, so we're, we're uh, good to go. Um, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here, and uh, I want to go over APRV and the uh, settings, the rationale, and the clinical application. And one of the first questions that we ask is that mechanical ventilation is required for many forms of illness. It's not just for support, but it uh, can be required for many forms of illness. But with it comes a lot of baggage. Um, uh, there are problems with mechanical ventilation, so we know it doesn't come trouble-free. So some of the uh, problems that we do have with mechanical ventilation, first of all, there was a study that was actually shown in 2004 that 25% of patients who went on mechanical ventilation with no lung injury at the outset, went on to develop acute lung injury just after 48 hours of simple mechanical ventilation. So there are uh, you know, problems with developing acute lung injury. There's an inferior gas distribution. It's just not a normal um, pulling of gas in as we normally would do. Gas is pushed in so it actually changes the um, distribution of gas. Uh, Ventilator-associated pneumonia has been, of course, associated with the ventilator and asynchrony. Patients just don't want to be on the ventilator and we're telling someone, we want you to breathe at 500 cc's 12 times a minute and we want you to do this because we believe it makes you feel better. So um, a new way of thinking, we want to look at possibly um, the old philosophy of conforming the patient to the ventilator, again dictating what they want to, maybe a new philosophy, conforming the ventilator to the patient. And with that is um, uh, APRV, and it's actually not a new mode. A lot of people have either never heard of it or never used it before. But it's actually been around for a long time, since 1987, and it was first made available um, uh, on the Avita One uh, back in 1987. And it's currently available today on most any ICU ventilator as an option or as a standard mode. It may be called by vent, it may be called by level, but the premise is the same. There are some caveats, and uh, we can go through any questions there about the different ventilators. But what is APRV? APRV in its uh, basic sense is CPAP with release. And Dr. Downs, when he first developed this, that was his um, uh, notion was CPAP with a brief release for augmenting CO2 removal. So if I look at the difference between this pressure form, as, which is very stable all the way across, the patient is responsible for 100% of the metabolic load to remove CO2. But if I add these brief releases in here, then I can actually help offset CO2 removal. And APRV, uh, uh, same as any other mode, comes with basic ingredients, <coughs> pressure, flow, and volume. And it's with these ingredients that we must have the right amounts. And if the right amounts of ingredients are not used, it may determine your success or your failure. So I like to look at the analogy of why are ingredients so important? Bless you. These are the basic ingredients and the recipe for a, um, uh, a dessert called pavlova. So we have our ingredients, we have our um, uh, measurements here, and our directions. So if we follow this basic uh, recipe, that our um, chance of success is uh, improved. But if we start deviating from that, so maybe we don't have exactly these right ingredients or we don't have as much time or uh, the, the way to do this, same with APRV. If I start changing it around a bit, my success may not be as great. So I look at the degree of success based on uh, my ingredients and the way that I apply that. So I'm going to ask you, is this APRV? It says it on the ventilator. It's set to APRV. The mode reads APRV. But is it really APRV as it was initially designed? And you have to look at this. This is 2 to 1 pressure control or BiPAP. This is a pressure of 18, a PEEP of 5, a rate of 8. And you can see I have a 2 to 1 IDE ratio. And these are actually real patients where people believe they're using APRV. And here, this is a, a um, very uh, extreme version of APRV where we have a rate of 32, a pressure of 36 with a PEEP of 22, and an IDE ratio of 1 to 1. 
So again, if you look at any studies, if you look at papers that they use APRV, please go to the methods section and look at how they've applied APRV and make sure it's actually in APRV as we're going to discuss today. So we want to look at the mechanical breath profile. And a lot of times APRV is referred to as it's the same as inverse ratio pressure control or inverse ratio BiPAP, that they're the same thing. And I want to show you today that they are different, that even though it's an inverse ratio, there is more time spent at the upper pressure than the lower pressure, I can divide those. Unlike a set IDE ratio, I can control the time at T low and the time at T high. So we'll go over the settings um, for APRV. You have a P high, a pressure high, a P low, a pressure low, time high, and time low. Together, the P high and the T high will make up the CPAP phase. And then together, the P low and the T low will make up what we call the release phase. Now you could call it the expiratory phase, but look at how brief it is. And the patient, remember, can breathe spontaneously throughout the entire respiratory cycle. So we call it a release phase rather than an expiratory phase. So let's first go through the P high. So the pressure high is enough pressure to open the lung but not over distend. So you want on your pressure volume curve to be on that steep portion. Patients don't like to breathe at the lower pressure or the higher pressure. So we want enough pressure to achieve FRC, but not to exceed TLC. And one of the reasons is we want to initiate a breath at an optimal lung volume. By restoring FRC, then we can take a breath here rather than here. And a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I think APRV is going to be very uncomfortable. I, I tried it on myself but you're at FRC. So you've already, with a pressure of 10, you've gotten to TLC, right? So patients are not, when they're sick, they're below FRC. So even if you have a pressure of 20, 25 centimeters, 30 centimeters, you just may be getting them to FRC, and now they can breathe on top of that pressure. So how do we set the ideal P high? How would you actually set this pressure? And from a pure volume control mode, no auto flow, no PRVC, you're going to want to transition using your plateau pressure. So if your inspiratory time is a little short, you may have to do an inspiratory hold, get your plateau pressure. That would be your P high. If you're going from a pressure mode, BiPAP, or from a dual targeted mode, PRVC, auto flow, you're going to use the peak pressure because it's a cl very close to the plateau pressure. And from HFOV, from high frequency, you would use your mean airway pressure and add 2 to 4 centimeters. So that's establishing your P high. Now I do want to go over a potential issue with using this transition with auto flow or PRVC. There are a couple of pitfalls. And one of the things is that if you see here, this is auto flow, and it's an algorithmic mode. So the pressure is adjusted in three centimeter increments to deliver that tidal volume at the lowest possible airway pressure. I set a tidal volume, but it's an open breathing system. So the patient, unlike pure volume mode, can actually take in a higher volume. So if you can see, this patient was set to 440 cc's. Now he's about 180 centimeters, he's very tall, about um, 100 kilos, really big guy, and they have tidal volume set at 440 cc's. But he's pulling over 700 cc tidal volume. So if you can see, look at the pressure tracing, what mode does that really look like? It actually looks like CPAP, doesn't it? So he's pulled the airway pressure all the way down to CPAP. So if I transition this patient over using the peak pressure, the peak pressure here is only 12, so that there's no delta pressure. So I have to look at what re is really being represented here. So in this case, I would want to consider increasing the tidal volumes that set, and so letting the um, algorithm adjust, or maybe even turning off autoflow, 
And in this case, when auto flow is turned off, now it's a closed breathing system. The patient is set for 500 cc tidal volume and is not going to get anything more. So now look at what happens to the pressure tracing. So the patient is actually pulling down through the PEEP level. The, the mean airway pressure is even measured at minus seven. So the patient is just making a tremendous amount of effort to pull in and wants more tidal volume, but is not going to be given that tidal volume. And you can see here, he's pulling all the way down through the PEEP. So an extreme amount of force. So in this case, the patient would need to be paralyzed in order to see what the true plateau pressure was. Here's an example of a patient, and if you can see a full, a, a, an adult pull in their sternum and pull that sternum towards the spine, that's an extreme amount of force, an extreme amount of work of breathing. And this could actually lead to negative pressure pulmonary edema, actually pulling in uh, edema. So how do we look at, is the P high too high when I'm transitioning my patient over? And what you have to do is assess both the waveform, what you see at the ventilator and your patient. What group of muscles is that patient using, inspiratory or expiratory? So in this case, you can see a lot of effort is being put on the expiratory side. So it's a patient that's bearing down and pushing and pushing the entire time. And you can really see that in the abdomen. The brain is telling the lungs they're too full. So they can actually, you can defend your lung volume. So if a patient looks like they're having a baby and forcefully pushing throughout the entire respiratory cycle, that P high may be too high. And the opposite is the P high not high enough. In this case, you can see the patient is pulling as much flow as the machine is delivering. So they're able to pull, and it's probably not high enough, and you're going to be able to see they're using their accessory muscles, they're really pulling, and they're forcefully trying to draw in that volume, that flow. So you'll be able to see this on the ventilator and on your patient. So is there a maximum P high? So we have to consider what's going against the chest wall in order to lift that chest wall. So there are forces that affect the um, uh, ability to expand the chest wall and expand the, the lungs. So if I have an obese patient who's lying flat in bed, maybe not spontaneously breathing, I might need a higher airway pressure than I would normally use in a thin patient. Also, the recruited lung will take less pressure than the recruiting lung, meaning that if you apply APRV earlier, before you have complete collapse, you may require lower airway pressures than if you try to use it as a rescue only. So with that, a P high more than 35 may be necessary in patients with lower thoracic and abdominal compliance. So let's look at an example here. We have a thin patient, not a lot of chest wall edema, still maybe spontaneously breathing. If I apply 20 centimeters to her or to you, that's going to be more than enough pressure, okay? So we have very little opposing pressure. That's plenty of airway pressure. But if I switch patients now, that same 20 centimeters on a patient who's obese, who's laying flat in bed, maybe not spontaneously breathing, so all of the abdominal contents are going to encroach into the thorax, this same 20 centimeters is not going to open that lung. So I'm going to need to increase that airway pressure. So now a P low, and there's a controversy over using a P low of zero, two, five, whatever um, uh, pressure may be in uh, some, some papers that you've read. And we use a P-low of zero for uh, a few reasons. Number one, decreases the expiratory resistance to gas flow. So we'll look at CO2 clearance, but APRV is very good at diffusive gas exchange. So while the P-high, T-high is being held during that CPAP phase, you have diffusive gas exchange. So now when I want to go release that 
um, breath, it's full of CO2. So if I actually add a resistor on top of the artificial airway, I may have a resistance to CO2 removal, and you can actually see CO2 go up. But the T-low must be set properly if you use a P-low of zero. But the other thing is we want to control end expiratory lung volume with time rather than pressure. So we're going to use the T-low as our PEEP. So if you can see here in this picture, you have um, the, again, CO2-enriched gas as it's being held during the CPAP phase. We have diffusive gas exchange. This is CO2-enriched gas. It comes out. The first resistor is your endotracheal tube. So the size of the airway is also going to determine the CO2, um, the ability for the CO2 to be removed. So as the um, CO2 comes out, you have a pressure drop here through the ventilator circuit, again, full of CO2. So now if I pinch the expiratory valve or I add a peep, that's going to cause CO2 to uh, be retained. So again, that's why we use a P-low of zero because we're adjusting the end expiratory lung volume, or PEEP, with time. So a lot of people believe, yeah, but you're still going to zero. I see it on the machine. It goes from, from 20 down to zero. But you have to look at the trajectory of the pressure. I'm not going to go from 20 down to zero in 0.5 seconds. So if you look at the pressure here, the arch of the tracing it's going to go about to a half of your P-high. And you can actually measure this on the ventilator. If you see here, this is a, um, uh, the tracheal pressure. And if you measure that, it's about one-third to one-half of the P-high. So now we, we've definitely established that we have enough PEEP at the P-low. So time high duration of the CPAP phase. So how long are we going to hold that P high? And the importance of time, both on the CPAP phase and the release phase. On the CPAP phase, APRV is going to use time to recruit and to maintain alveolar stability. And on the release phase, we're going to use a very minimal amount of time to prevent de-recruitment. So the near continuous CPAP phase is going to aid in the elastic work of breathing so patients can breathe much easier during the CPAP phase. So if you look here at, uh, this is a, um, uh, both a gross um, picture of a lung and then an in vivo microscopy. And I want to start this and show you, if I stop right there, that's a one second eye time. So if you think about it in conventional ventilation, look at how much recruitment or how little recruitment that I have during that one second time. Now this is a video showing only pressure being held, no difference in pressure, only time. So this is pressure being held over 40 seconds. And just watch how the lung continues to recruit. Through collateral channels, it continues to open, and your lung will continue to recruit just over time. There's no addition of pressure. So you can see these little areas are going to continue to fill in. This it popped open here. It's going to start filling in. Again, just time. So then under in vivo microscopy, you can see you have a recruitment here, and then all of this area is going to continue to fill. And in about 30 seconds, we're even going to fill this whole channel right here. This area is going to continue to fill. Again, no change in pressure, only time. So we can see it's almost there. And it continues to fill and it'll pop open. So we look at the CPAP phase as the, the duration of the entire respiratory cycle. So if I have CPAP, then my CPAP duration is 100%, right? So I have absolutely no release if I have pure CPAP. But I wanna be as close to CPAP as possible, but actually add some releases 
So in the adult, we're going to want about 90%, at least 90% of the total cycle time to be at that CPAP phase. And you can calculate this. First of all, in order to get a rate when you're using APRV, you take your time high plus your time low and divide that into 60. So in this case, I have five and a half seconds at time high, 0.5 seconds at time low, divided by 60 is a, um, a, a six second cycle time and a rate of 10. Is that good? Everybody understand that? So that's, a, that's my cycle time. Now, if I look at how much of that then is at the T high, how much of that is at that CPAP phase? So now I can take my calculation and say, if my time high is 5.5 seconds and divide it into my, my total cycle time of six seconds, then this is going to be 92% CPAP. So 92% of the time I'm spent here and 8% of the time I'm spent at the release phase, okay? And that, again, is going to establish that alveolar stability, going to aid in recruitment, have just a little bit of release to uh, um, uh, help with CO2 removal. And if you look at this, you'll actually see in conventional ventilation, this is why we have PEEP. The majority of time is spent at the lower pressure. And if we simply flip that over, the majority of time in APRV is spent at the upper pressure. So the ability to recruit is much higher. So what are our ideal ranges for time high? And we can look at that, unlike pressure, we can look at that in three different ranges as far as patient ranges. So we have adults, pediatrics, and neonates based on the rate that you would use. So in adults, a range between four to six seconds. In pediatrics, a range between three to five. And in neonates, a range of one and a half to two seconds. So what you're doing, based on also the T-low, which we'll go over in great detail, which is also tailored based on your um, uh, waveform and your patient size, the ideal CPAP duration in adults, as we said, is about 90%. But in maybe underdeveloped neonates or um, someone without a high recruitability, you're going to need more bulk ventilation. So your time high is going to be a little bit lower, and you're going to have about 80 to 85% of that CPAP time. So meaning that less time spent at the T high than we normally would. So let's look at if you were getting ready just to put a patient on APRV. We've already established our P high. Let's say we are transitioning from a volume mode with a plateau pressure of 22. So that's our P high. And then our P low is zero. And then what T high would we pick? So for an adult, if they're um, stable and their pH um, and PCO2 is relatively normal, you can pick a T high of 5.5. It's in that range of between four seconds and six seconds, and 5.5 would be a good starting point. For a pediatric, four seconds, and for a neonate, maybe 1.75. So again, these are just basic starting T highs. But if my patient's a little bit more unstable, maybe the pH is a little low, the PCO2 is a little high, and I need a little bit more bulk ventilation, maybe they have also a metabolic acidosis that I need to let resolve because if I try to lower my rate, my pH is going to continue to drop. So I might need a little bit more bulk ventilation until that resolves. So if they're a little um, unstable and you need to also continue with volume uh, resuscitation, then you're going to want to go to the lower end, maybe four seconds, four and a half seconds, three seconds for pediatrics, one and a half for neonates. So more bulk ventilation is required. The other thing is um, a lot of people talk about, well, when I transitioned over to APRV, um, it made their blood pressure drop. You have to consider, and Dr. Abashi will go over this, also the hemodynamic stability and volume resuscitation. 
So volume is very important. And this is actually a, um, an early signal to show you the status of volume uh, in your patient. So now let's look at the T low, which is extremely important and probably one of the most difficult parts to really um, uh, get a handle on with APRV. And the adjustment of T low is based on your expiratory gas flow. And we set to terminate at 75% of the peak expiratory flow rate. And I'll go over um, the calculation. And, uh, but Dr. Abashi actually looked at this when he first started using APRV about uh, 20 years ago. And his patients would come back to, uh, from the OR, and the um, uh, standard T low was always 0.8. And so what he saw was a change in the angle of the deceleration of gas flow. And so every time he would decrease the T-low, the PO2 would go up, but there was no change in the CO2. So every time he kept reducing the T-low until he got to 75%, there was no change in CO2. And it was only when he went beyond that that the um, termination was above 75% would he see a rise in CO2. So we'll go over that um, again here. So how do you calculate the T low? And we can actually even go through this also on the ventilator. But you want to look at your expiratory gas flow. So on the gas flow pattern, not loops, but the flow pattern. So as gas comes out of the lung, you establish a peak expiratory flow rate. So the fastest point is your peak expiratory flow rate. And if left untouched, it will decelerate all the way to zero. So let's say in this uh, instance we have a T-low set at one second or uh, one and a half seconds. It's going to go all the way to zero. So as I start decreasing my T-low, I look at my peak expiratory flow rate. And if I multiply that times 0.75 in this example, I have 100 liters of peak expiratory flow rate multiplied by 0.75, 75%. I want to stop that gas flow from going out at 75%. So which here is 75 liters, and then the gas flow will go back up into the inspiratory phase. So in this case, you can see the T-low would be 0.55 seconds. So let's look at three different lung states. We have the normal lung state. And so if the gas flow comes out, in this case, I have a peak flow of 60 liters, a 45 degree angle of deceleration. And in this case, my peak expiratory flow rate is 60. And at 75% of that number, which is around 37, then I'm going to have 75% and my T-low is set at 0.5. So let's say this patient goes to the OR, gets a lot of volume, gets um, uh, uh, anesthesia, stops spontaneously breathing, and when they come back at that same T-low of 0.5 seconds, you notice that the angle has changed to be much steeper. So it's less than 45 degrees, and the peak expiratory flow rate is higher because there's more um, recoil um, from the chest wall, maybe from edema, so it's actually pushing down faster. The angle is much steeper, you can see here, rather than this 45 degrees. So the same T low of 0.5 seconds is going to actually go all the way to zero and I'm going to lose all of this end expiratory lung volume. So I want to retain that by now taking my T low and moving that, in this case, back to 0.35 seconds. You see that there? So peak expiratory flow rate times 75%. Now I move that back, and now instead of going all the way out here, it goes straight back up there. And then in obstructive lung cases, which um, I don't want to get into great detail, but you have actually, instead of a high peak expiratory flow rate, you have a very low peak expiratory flow rate, and your angle is more than 45 degrees. It's very flat, 
And in this case, you want to let the, the uh, gas flow come out, and it's going to take a lot longer time. So instead of 0.5 seconds, I'm going to go out to about 1.2 seconds. And again, this is in chronic obstructive lung disease. So um, Dr. Abashi will uh, go over some uh, data showing um, improperly set APRV at 10% and properly set APRV at 75%. And I just want to show you the difference of what those look like. So if I have an improperly set um, T-low where the gas flow instead of stopping at 75% goes all the way to 10%, you can see the alveoli close. You can see a lot of airway closure, and you see how the alveoli completely close. So in this case, we take this improperly set, and we decrease the T-low to where now we have 75% and very little airway closure. So you can see the alveoli stay open, and they don't collapse. So that led us actually to look at this a little bit more, and we did an abstract on setting the T low and alveolar stability. What happens to the alveoli if I don't have my T low set properly? So we took four different measurements. We took a T low set at 10%, 25%, 50%, and 75%. So let's go over each one of those. These are in vivo microscopy. The whole top row is the inspiratory or the P-high, T-high CPAP phase. And this bottom row is the release phase where the T-low is. So the first one, we set the T-low to terminate at 10% of 100 liters. So we have 100 liters of, of uh, flow, expiratory flow. We let it go all the way out until it reaches only 10% of that number. So let's say a T-low of 0.8. And you can see from the CPAP phase to the release phase, there's a lot of airway closure, a lot of collapse. Where it was filled here before, we see a lot of collapse. So now let's take the T-low and we'll go from 0.8 to 0.7. And now that's 25% of this number. So I have a peak expiratory flow rate. It decays until I get to 25% of 100. So 100 times 25%, it goes to 25. And then now you see less airway closure. There's still airway closure, but some of this has been retained a little bit more here. And so I have better um, uh, I have uh, maintained my stability and I have less airway closure. So now I'm going to go to 50%. I'm going to take my T-low. It was at 0.8. It was at 0.7. I'm going to go to 0.6. And now you can see 50%. So 100 times 50% is 50 liters. And you can see now I'm actually having more stability, less airway closure. And then I ultimately get to 75%, 0 0.5 of a T-low. And now I take 100 times 75%, 75 liters. And you can see very little difference between the inspiratory and the release phase, between the CPAP phase and the release phase. There's less than 10% change between these two um, uh, phases. But that's still enough for CO2 removal because during this time, I had diffusive clearance of CO2. Now I have accumulated all of the CO2 with a P-low of zero, no resistance. Now all of that CO2 can be removed. So actually, we did some videos of the in vivo microscopy. So this is APRV set at 10%, and you can see a lot of instability. The airways completely close and uh, um, create instability. I go to 50% and I still see airway closure, but it's not as bad. And then if I go to 75%, you can see that the alveoli barely move. But again, that's enough to clear the CO2.
So the T low must be assessed frequently. Now on the Draeger, on the V500, you have a feature called auto release. So everything that I just told you, you can actually walk up to the ventilator and set the uh, termination to 75% and you don't have to do any measurements. But it's good to know and it's good to understand exactly what you're measuring. But a T low must be measured frequently and looked at because a restrictive patient can become obstructive. So if you see a patient that looked like this with a nice 45 degree angle, and you can see probably the T low could be a little bit shorter here, but you see a nice angle and it goes back up to baseline. And then maybe a little bit later you see this it's completely flat across the bottom. There's no angle. If you can see here, the gas flow would continue here to zero. Here it's flat. So no matter what, how long we set our T low, the gas flow is not coming out. And in this case, it was a patient that had a lot of um, uh, pulmonary contusions, a lot of bloody secretions, and the endotracheal tube filled with all of this crusty blood and you could still pass a suction catheter this way, but remember as gas flow comes out, it actually created a one-way valve. So gas flow is going in, but not coming out. So again, you need to just assess that flow pattern and watch um, that release. There are also um, uh, T low issues. Um, some of the ventilators, you have the ability to add pressure support on top of the P high. So what this adds is a couple of things. First of all, it actually adds where it tries to synchronize. So if you have a patient that tries to take a breath, or in this case, this was actually a patient that was brain dead. So no spontaneous breathing, but there was actually the heartbeat sense and a little bit of a leak. And you can see here, this is a T low set to 0.5 seconds. And you can see the width here of this release looks like about half a second. But then all of a sudden the tidal volumes went from the 500s to a liter. And you can see the width, it's much wider. But the T low is still set to 0.5 seconds. So what happened was it tried to synchronize and it actually extended that T low on its own. So these are some issues with um, this particular ventilator, and you can actually watch this. This is a video. The T low is set to four seconds, but you can see a heartbeat and a little bit of a leak. Again, this is a brain dead patient, so you saw that went from 500. The tidal volumes will now go to over a liter, and the T low has never changed. It's still set to 0.4. And you can see, and look at the difference between these two. So you can see the one that's set at 0.4, and you can see what it does on its own. It's actually trying to synchronize. And this actually is um, uh, another ventilator where it does the same thing. This is just a still picture. You can see the T low is set at 0.6. And then you can see the next breath, because of the trigger, it actually extended the T low on its own. So it went from a previous ID ratio of about 8 or 9 to 1 to 1 to um, uh, 0.5, or to 1 to 5. And then this video, oops, sorry, you can actually mm -hmm. see in this video it will do the same thing. And then it goes from a 9 to 1. And watch this to a one to uh, one to six or a, yeah. So it actually just changes dramatically. <coughs> so there are actual factors that influence that peak expiratory flow rate. So when you're looking at the peak expiratory flow rate, the size of the endotracheal tube. So the smaller endotracheal tube size that I have, then my peak expiratory flow rate is going to be lower because I don't have as much area for the gas flow to leave. Obstruction, as you saw, the peak expiratory flow rate goes down greatly whenever there's an obstruction, um, which can be caused by secretions. The expiratory filter, if you have an expiratory filter um, uh, at the ventilator, if it becomes saturated um, uh, with moisture, with secretions, it will also reduce your peak expiratory flow rate.
or if you set a P low. And you can watch this. You can measure your peak expiratory flow rate at a P low of 5, and then you'll see that your peak expiratory flow rate goes down. So if it was at 100 liters, it may be now 80 liters. And we actually looked at secretions and how secretions are mobilized, especially uh, using APRV. Because we recruit the lung, we get gas behind the secretions, we open up the alveoli, and we have high expiratory flow rates. The combination of that, in our experience, has led to patients who were not coughing, not spontaneously breathing, um, uh, or not, um, very um, de-recruited. As soon as you recruited them, secretions would just start coming out of the uh, catheter and you would just be suctioning um, uh, quite frequently. And this is actually an older study looking at two-phase gas liquid transport. So if you look at the flow rates from uh, an inspiratory um, normal IDE ratio, as you increase the IDE ratio, there's more flow on the expiratory side than on the inspiratory side. So now if you think about which direction is that flow causing the secretions to go? Is it moving it this way towards the alveolus or this way towards the ventilator? So this was a patient that was on a 4 to 1 IDE ratio. And if you look at the peak expiratory flow rate, it's around, let's say, 40 to 50 liters. And if you can see, it decays all the way to zero because we're still on pressure control. Now, we transitioned over to APRV, but you can see it's flat across the bottom. So remember, that's no good. We need an angle. Okay, so this is flat across the bottom. The volumes drop significantly, and um, they said something's wrong. So we actually had them suction the patient, suction out the catheter, and now you can see just after suctioning, now we have a completely different waveform. We have a nice angle, and they said there was a lot of secretions. So let's look at the difference between these three flow patterns. We have a peak expiratory flow rate of about 50 liters. It actually didn't change much here. It's still about 50 liters, even though we're on APRV now. But as soon as they suction, you can see the peak expiratory flow rate is really about 80 liters. So we started looking at this, and between pressure control 4 to 1 to typical standard settings on APRV, which is about an 8 to 1 IDE ratio if you look at it that way, that it actually, the flow rates are much higher. So we thought, let's look at how that moves secretions. So we had some respiratory therapists that did a little experiment. Then they took these little balloons and they tied them to a bronchial tree. They made a bronchial tree and they made the secretions out of Guire's gum. And uh, of course they had to color it yellow, uh, green. Um, and uh, so they filled each balloon. Now this is pressure control four to one and watch the, as the pressure goes in, you can see this little meniscus is going to get more shallow. So you can see it's actually pushing and the secretions are moving up the side a little bit here. You can see it's moving up the side here. So again, the flow rates are higher on the expiratory side than on the inspiratory side. But now let's switch over to APRV, the same airway pressure. No difference in pressure, again, just a difference in time. So if you watch here, this is on APRV, and it's a little hard to see, but you can see this well here, this meniscus, completely disappears. And where did the secretions go? It starts filling all up in the airways. And you'll see this on your patients. When you transition over to APRV and all of a sudden they have massive amounts of secretions, it's again because of the two-phase gas liquid transport, more um, higher flow rates on the expiratory side than on the inspiratory side. And then CO2 clearance, there's a lot of, uh, always a lot of questions about CO2 clearance. The one thing that doesn't change, hopefully, is your cardiac output. So during the CPAP phase, you have diffusive movement of gas. You also have the heartbeat actually has cardiogenic mixing, so it'll kind of vibrate the CO2.
And we, um, I, the easiest way that I learned was bulk ventilation and then alveolar and bulk ventilation. So diffusive and then diffusive and convective clearance. So bulk ventilation, if I'm on standard conventional ventilation and I need to remove CO2, I increase the rate. So if you think of that, it's like having a cup. And so you just go faster and faster, okay? And you get rid of CO2 that way. Diffusive ventilation or alveolar ventilation is more like a bucket. So now I'm going to submerge the bucket in and I'm going to let it fill with CO2. One second, two second, three second, four seconds, five seconds again during that diffusive phase. And now with my clearance, with my CO2 removal is on my T low or my P low set to zero. So APRV and dead space ventilation, this is actually on conventional ventilation. And you can see here's an area of uh, dead space. And then transitioning over to APRV, it actually goes straight up. No dead space. Because again, the CO2 is being moved up into the upper airways. So just real quickly, ways to improve CO2 clearance. It's not just one thing. You have to look at several things. So the, first of all, it, do you have enough surface area? If you look at a chest x-ray and you still have massive amounts of collapse, you may need a higher P-high. So again, you cannot diffuse CO2 across a collapsed alveoli. You have to have the alveoli open in order to exchange gas. So you may need a higher P-high. You may need a higher T-high which is a little bit counterintuitive. Why would I decrease my rate to clear CO2? But again, that's mean airway pressure, diffusive ventilation, so maybe a little bit more time will actually remove CO2. But your T-high may be too high. We actually had a physician who was starting out on her P-high transition at about 96, 97% CPAP. So that was a little too much for that patient to offload. So they may need a few more releases. So you may need to actually decrease the T high until you gain surface area. And then the T low should only be adjusted if it's set incorrectly. So if it's set at 50%, you don't want to keep increasing the T low. Although increasing the T low, you will have CO2 removal. Your volumes will go up. But in about an hour, you're going to have more collapse because you've decreased your PEEP, right? So if I increase my T low inappropriately, I'm not retaining the end expiratory lung volume. It's analogous to dropping your PEEP. So here's a T low that was set incorrectly. So if you see here, you have um, uh, this one. Actually, it's a really small picture, but it's set and it terminates at about 90%. So that's too short, so we actually need to, you can't see that little yellow line there very well, but we actually need to increase our T low, and that helps with CO2 removal. Again, only because it was set incorrectly. And then uh, quickly, just triggers in APRV. Um, we uh, talked a little bit about pressure support. And just remember, adding pressure support on top of P-high can potentially be unsafe. If you're at or near TLC and you have no trigger, everybody take a deep breath. Now try to breathe on top of that. It's really hard, right? Okay, so our diaphragms are flat. We cannot breathe on top of that. But if I take a deep breath and now I add pressure support and I assist and I add more volume on top of that, all I have to do is just trigger the vent and I could potentially be in an unsafe area by adding more on top of that P high. And just spontaneous breathing real quick uh, because Dr. Bashi will cover this in great detail. Um, uh, this is actually taken from a paper again. APRV had the highest work of breathing and unfortunately they were right. But the reason was because how it was set. And if you look at these typical time highs, one second, 1.6 seconds, IDE ratios of two to one, 1.3 to one, and uh, they added P lows, 
And of course, the patients had a hard time breathing. But we can show you that our patients are very comfortable. These are on uh, airway pressures that are um, uh, maybe 25, um, 30 centimeters, and they're not quite ready to be extubated because they have other issues. And we have them uh, on that uh, um, alveolar stability phase. They're just now become, you know, became stable on uh, their pressure volume curve. We, we're not going to take that away. So again, these are patients, lots of patients uh, getting up. And he's got a chest tube there. And he's going to get up and navigate his way around. Very comfortable, spontaneously breathing. Again, these aren't patients that are ready to be extubated within a couple of uh, uh, minutes, and we hurried up and took a picture right before that. So, uh, as I said, Dr. Basho covers spontaneous breathing, so I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. No questions about settings? <coughs> yes? Any failure rates for CO2 removal? Yes, for APRB. Yes, and well, and, and actually, you know, CO2 removal because, again, it, you have to look at the recruitability. So if you have a patient that comes back um, and the CO2 is high, we're going to look at all of these different um, uh, factors. Is the P high, high enough? Is the T high set appropriately? What are all the um, uh, um, settings? And I can show you that we actually use APRB on brain dead patients with adequate CO2 removal on uh, t uh, tra traumatic brain injured patients that are maybe placed in a pentobarb coma again with adequate CO2 removal. We just don't see a lot of um, issues with CO2 um, uh, just from using APRV. And the failure, uh, again, of using APRV over any other mode, um, uh, as Dr. Bashi likes to say, um, strip away the name of the mode and just set the scaffolding and how the lung is going to respond to the settings that you have. So if you, you know, recruit the lung and then keep it open, then um, uh, I don't see really it as different uh, from any other mode. But we actually have, um, we, I presented a case study um, uh, at a, a poster session on rescue from HFOV. And actually, HFOV was not working. They were actually going to transport the patient for ECMO. And in order to transport, because they couldn't use HFOV in transport, they put the patient on APRV, and immediately the patient recruited. So rather than transporting for ECMO, they actually just kept him on the APRV and, and were able to subsequently extubate him. Um, I won't tell you that APRV is going to cure absolutely every patient. There's never a failure, um, but I don't, uh, I don't see that we've ever really abandoned that mode and went to anything else.